I uh, didn't get a chance to really go through uh, the announcements uh, at the break on Saturday very well, but uh, Sue uh, Bellavo has wanted me to announce this again. Uh, of course, in the Feast of Tabernacles with Sukkot, uh, when we use the, the lulav and we wave the lulav during the feast, those of you that are familiar with the feast, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, those uh, will be available to take orders actually July 8th, which will be next Monday. So you can see Sue Bellavo about that, or you can um, call our office and uh, order that. Uh, we, we're really having a power-packed um, July, uh, because obviously many of you know, uh, in the middle of July, we're going to the Christians United for Israel Summit in Washington, D.C. We have an, uh, a few of the young adults that are going, uh, which is exciting, uh, and a number of others as well. This is particularly hot, not just hot temperature-wise, but hot. Uh, because of the issues that are happening right now around the world. Uh, of course, Iran and Syria that affects the United States, Israel. Uh, and so uh, when we walk uh, through the corridors of the Capitol, the Rayburn Building and some of these others, uh, we'll have a number of people not only from El Shaddai, but also from um, the state of Washington and of course all the other states as well. Uh, they love to see us in Washington. The hotels and the restaurants, and, and, and the attractions, and the rental car companies, and I don't know if the politicians like to see us, but uh, they have to see us because we, we pay their way. So, uh, and then of course, following right on the heels of that, Pastor Mark uh, gets on another plane right from DC and goes to Denver uh, for a prophecy conference there with individuals like Jonathan Kahn, who did the Harbinger. He's, uh, he'll be speaking there along with uh, Chuck Missler and many other names that you're familiar with. So the impact is gonna be tremendous uh, relative to the message that El Shaddai has. Uh, and so you wanna keep that in prayer. And it's still, it's still, if people want to attend Washington, D.C., uh, just bring your own air conditioner and you'll just be fine. Okay, last but not least, our homegrown uh, Dan and Brenda Cathcart, of course, and I'll hold this more steady this time, have released a new book, The Sign of Jonah, which they've worked on. This is no piker work. Uh, it's really a good work. I've gone through it, and uh, it's available not only on Amazon, uh, but they have some of these here tonight. So those of you that are watching us uh, live streaming, uh, you can call our office too, and we can, uh, we can get those sent out to you uh, through the, the Cathcarts at this time. So are you all cool tonight? I was, assure, I was assured that the reason we might have a few more people here tonight is because you don't have air conditioning in your house. But that's okay, I'm glad you turned out anyway. And all, all of you that are watching this live streaming, uh, we appreciate you watching us uh, as well um, and joining with us as part of this congregation uh, worldwide and across the US. So, why don't we stand and I'll have a word of prayer and then we'll get into uh, the prophecy of the prophets tonight. Are you ready? Lord God, God of heaven and earth, you are the mighty one. You are the eternal one. You are the one who knows the end from the beginning. You know our destinies. You've known us from our mother's womb. Father, you know what's ahead of us, Father, and you even more so. Uh, you show us which way to go. Your wisdom is unfathomable. Your understanding is infinite. And you have called us to this day and time. We could have been born in another time, another land, but Father, we're here. And also those that are watching in the sound of my voice around the world, uh, they're tuning in for, for no small reason, uh, but because you've called them to do so. So bless these people tonight and all who have come to hear your Torah, but more so, Father, that it glorifies you. And that, Father, that there's something that, that all of these individuals can take and practically uh, apply to their lives day by day in the purpose of your will. In the name of our God, who is our Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Okay, if you could bring up that first slide for me there. We're, we're uh, continuing with Prophecy of the Prophets, uh, but tonight actually... Um, uh, and this is going to be happening. We, we went over the schedule now um, uh, last week. This is actually going to go into next year. I mean, the, the things that are going to overlap in this are going to be, I'm going to use some of Pastor Mark's $1,000 words, incredible. 
But tonight, it's fascinating what we're going to learn because a little bit of, a wee bit of Jeremiah and where it crosses with the prophet Joel. And uh, because there are, there are similarities, but I think you're going to see some things that are going to open up that are fascinating. And as I said, um, we're opening uh, tonight with the book of Joel and a little bit about uh, how Jeremiah is involved with that. Now, right on your notes... In Acts chapter 2, verse 14, and those of you that are watching or you that you may be here for the first time, you're familiar with the Feast of Pentecost. Well, the Feast of Shavuot is really what it's known in in Hebrew. And on the Feast of Shavuot, over 2,000 years ago, uh, the apostles, after Yeshua was was ascended into heaven, uh, they they met a number of days later, and uh, they received Holy Spirit. They manifested Holy Spirit. And it takes place in Acts chapter 2. But there are some significant things that happen uh, with Peter, uh, of what he spoke uh, after they manifested. There's a number of people there because it was a feast of Pentecost. And here he says, he makes a statement that's from the Tanakh, the Old Testament. When I say Tanakh, it's Old Testament. As you know it, it says in Acts 2.14, but Peter which he's a little bit charged up now. He says, standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice and said unto them, you men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. And this is really important, okay? Uh, Just this, and you're gonna remember these phrases as we go through all the way to the end of this tonight. Uh, Because he addresses here, you men of Judea and of Jerusalem, Be this known unto you and hearken to to my words. And he's talking about the other apostles. These guys aren't drunk, as you suppose, because they're accusing. It's but the third hour of the day. So they're they're probably at the temple, which we we believe is that they're at the temple. So the whole, all of the people could see God manifesting his Holy Spirit. It's the third hour of the day. So it was a morning time of morning prayer. And then he says, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he goes into what we're going to share in a little bit of Joel tonight. In Joel chapter 1, and I want to I go through this here quickly. Joel, which is interesting, it's, it's actually, uh, you see the last part of Joel is L. Uh, and uh, in the Hebrew, it's the, uh, the Aleph, the Lamed. Uh, and it means God is Jehovah, Yehovah. And in Joel chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. And again, you see these names now. It's really interesting because this isn't Superman's father. It's not KL or JL. And quite frankly, and I just found this out recently from reading it in a AARP magazine <laughs> about Superman that the, uh, that the creators of, of Superman uh, were two Jews. And, and so Superman's parents, they, you know, they have these suffixes on their names, which is L. And uh, so it's interesting, and they, and they say, well, when they give a biography, and they say, well, who, you know, what was Clark Kent's religion? Well, he was Jewish. His middle name was Joseph. Isn't that incredible? Of course, he's not around, but that's beside the point. But that's what we see here. Joel, Pethuel. Uh, Pethuel is, is his father. And it means Pethuel, which is not mentioned anywhere else. It means the open-heartedness or sincerity of God. And he is not mentioned any place else. It's in the sense of God wooing to come towards him. So you have Joel, who is God, is Jehovah, and then you have Pethuel, the open-heartedness or the sincerity of God. Now, the thing about the book of Joel, or Joel, is there's very, very, uh, there's not a lot of detail. There's a lot of absence of detail. There's no accurate dating of this prophecy. Um, of course, Pastor Morgan, I'm going to bring up the timeline in, in a minute. Uh, we don't really know when this, when Joel prophesied. They have an idea, which I'm going to show you in just a couple of minutes here, when it could have been, but that's what makes this prophecy very, very unique because it spans from the the past, the present, into the future. Now, get this. The dating actually could be about 760 B.C., or it might not be till after 537 B.C.E., and how do they know this? Well, even anybody that could, would, would, you would read the book of Joel, 
a number of times, you'll see this for yourself because many of you are already knowledgeable. And I know Pastor Mark and, and our other teachers as well, when, when we go to teach something like this or a Torah portion, the, the place that we start, because um, I don't know if many of you knew this, but we have a, a research team at El Shaddai uh, and uh, we spend time uh, discussing certain topics uh, for accountability reasons and also for future projects. Uh, so we discuss, well, how do we come about with this topic, or how, how do we discuss this, or how do we teach this? And of course, the best place to always start before you teach, and you need to all know this, is you first you read everything. You got to read it first, and you don't read it just once, you read it about 15 times. And so you begin to get a feel of those chapters, so that, that, that they're very, very fresh in your mind. And so as you begin to read it, you begin to see the absence of detail that's in this book. And one of the things is, is that, as you know, uh, that Pastor Mark has been teaching about Jeremiah is that uh, the captivity, of course, with Babylon and then also with Assyria, the problems with Assyria, those were things that spanned a period of time that were very important in Israel's history, that was responsible for their captivity. And so in the book of Joel, Assyria is not even mentioned and not only that, because Assyria didn't rise to power until about 760, nor is Babylon mentioned by name. So if you can bring up that next slide for me. So quite frankly, as we look at this here, uh, Joel, here's, uh, here's Hezekiah's reign. You can see where uh, Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, and Assyria takes Israel into captivity around this period of here, 722. But Joel, because the absence of, of Assyria is not any place in this, he could be as early as 800 BC. And then on the other hand, because of some other things, and now this is jumping all the way into the future uh, with uh, Jeremiah, and you see here Jeremiah 32, about 500, and this is right before Esther, and uh, when Cyrus gives the decree, 500 BC, Joel could have been around that time as well. No uh, common, uh, commentator of the word, sage, uh, scholar, uh, can attest to either one of those, although there's a lot of things. But that's the thing about Joel, it's a mysterious prophecy in that it spans a period of time into the future. Judah and Jerusalem are alone the subject of this prophecy. There's no mention of Israel, the northern kingdom. And when I read Acts chapter 2, verse 14, who was uh, Peter addressing on Shavuot? He says, you men of what? Judah and Jerusalem. And since Judah and Jerusalem are mentioned and not the northern kingdom... And this is very much like Zephaniah, most likely uh, Joel, Joel lived in uh, Judah or even possibly Jerusalem because of the detail. There is no mention of any kings. And you can see that from these other prophets. They're, they're, they mention who the king is who reigned during that time, sometimes many kings. There's no mention of any kings or any royal princes, which are mentioned in the book of Zephaniah. But then again, on the other hand, as, as, the, as the scholars say, neither does Obadiah, Jonah, Nahum, or Habakkuk mention any princes or kings either. Okay, so that's why they jockey back and forth as to when this could actually be written. But they actually, the, 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 what is mentioned, and I'm going to go over these points, is who is mentioned are priests and ministers of the sanctuary. Okay, well, why are priests mentioned and kings are not mentioned. Kings are really important. Why, uh, why are priests mentioned and not the kings? Well, a little hint as to when the chronology could be is in 2 Kings 11, and this isn't on your notes, it doesn't need to be. It was during the time of King Ahaziah, uh, who uh, after his death, uh, his mother, Athaliah, she reigned for a short period but she slained all of the royal seed. This is in 2 Kings chapter 11. But one of the sons, Joash, his sister, took him and hid him before he could be killed by Athaliah. And he was hidden for six years. Now there was a high priest at that time whose name was Jehoiada. And uh, he orchestrated things after a period of time and Athaliah was put out of commission, and Joash came into reign uh, right around this period of time, the earlier date. Uh, he came into reign at the age of seven, okay? 
And so typically when a very, very young king comes into a reign, like six years old, in Jerusalem, in Israel, the high priest will take the supremacy as far as the training of the king and the regency over the king. So there's no mention of a king, but it mentions the priests. Okay, and this is pretty, this is pretty typical. So it mentions the priests and the ministers of the sanctuary. And there's also not any specific reference to idolatry or moral and social sins like there is in Jeremiah. Or as other prophets during the reign of the kings like Ahab and Manasseh and the kings who didn't tear down the altars of idolatry. Okay, so that, that kind of stuff is not mentioned. Earlier prophets would have spoken of the enemies of Israel as typically as Babylon, the northern kingdom, or Assyria. But in the last chapter of Joel, uh, they do mention, he does mention Greece, uh, which is significant, and he also mentions Egypt and Edom, who are almost eternal enemies of, uh, of Israel. Now, on your notes, what I did for you is, is in, your, in most English Bibles, like the King James Version, most English Bibles, Joel is just three chapters, okay? But in the Hebrew Bible, it's four chapters. So what I did was, as I put it on your notes, it's on the last two pages. You have the four chapters in a 10 size font uh, from the Jewish Publication Society, which, you know, is, is kind of a reading version, uh, but it's a Hebrew, it's uh, from the Jewish Publication Society version of Joel, which is four chapters, which is in the Hebrew Bible. Now, another thing about Joel is that the day of the Lord is mentioned Five times. What book and what, what book in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, is the day of the Lord mentioned six times? I just taught it three weeks ago. It's Zephaniah it was mentioned six times. Okay, but in um, Obadiah, it's mentioned once, and that's actually the first place that it is mentioned. Okay, the day of the Lord. And when we talk about the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord spans all the way into the New Testament or the Brit Hadashah. Paul mentions the day of the Lord. It's in the book of Revelation, so it's pretty common uh, as far as the context of the, of the past through the future. And that's what I want to talk about right now is because the day of the Lord, the last days, uh, the latter days, uh, all of this people have framed in their minds uh, with imaginations that are quite frankly, uh, relevant or culturally relative to their time frame, to their life context, to their culture. Uh, people's imaginations uh, generate a lot of things about the last days, the end times. Hollywood loves it, right? And what's so typical about America is that in America, we think everything revolves around America. We believe that the world, our view is the world view. And the views that come out of um, Hollywood, we think, you know, some, we believe that sometimes that they're true, what we see in the movies. Technology has changed science, and uh, science fiction gets the best of people sometimes, particularly relative to the last days. The prospect of death itself generates the fear of dying and what to expect at the end of the tunnel. So when we talk about the end times, what do you think, I mean, what does that mean? Termination, the, the last days, Okay. Well, in a London um, suburb years ago in the late 19th century, there was a group of boys that were playing, uh, and one of the number of young boys and one of the big boys picked up one of the younger boys and threw him up in the air, and he missed. Didn't catch him, and he fell down, and he broke his leg. Well, the leg didn't set right, and so it had to be rebroken. He was just a very young boy, probably five or six. He was laid up for a year, but it became a turning point in this individual's life. His name was Bertie Wells. And he read extensively, everything he could get his hands on for a whole year, he couldn't do anything else. He lived in a basement with his parents in London. His father owned a, a, a crockery shop, and that was his whole life, was in that basement. Uh, and then finally, when that business went upside down, he went to live with his mother, uh, who was a housekeeper in a wealthy home. But when he became 13 years old, he had to, to, to make a living, so he went to uh, work in a, a dry goods store, or they, a dry goods shop at that time. He worked 14 hours a day. His passion was literature and reading. 
and absorbing knowledge. And uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't take it, and he would sneak out sometimes just to read books. Uh, and then finally, one day, he couldn't take it anymore. And after two years, he walked 15 miles. And we're talking about a guy with a, that had a kid with a busted leg broken twice. And he swore to his mother that he would kill himself if he had to stay working. Just talking about the destiny of a person's life. So he wrote to an old school teacher, and he expressed the same thing. He couldn't take what he was doing anymore. He had a passion for literature. Schoolmaster wrote him back, and he says, you know, why don't you come and work for me? Is that you could be a teacher. I can teach you how to be a teacher. He thought that was great. And so he was a teacher's assistant uh, in, his, in his mid to late teens. But one day he was playing football, or maybe soccer it was in England, and in a pile-up, he was knocked down, he was trampled, his kidney was punctured, his lungs were punctured, one of his lungs was punctured, he almost died. And he was in such bad shape, but he held on for 12 terrible years. But during that time, he had a very, very vivid imagination, and he continued to, to write, and he would just write and write and read. He became so discouraged with his writing that he just, he burned everything up that he wrote and he was, he was just gonna quit. But he was asked to come back to teach when he was well and he met this girl whose name was Catherine Robbins. And they hit it off and they were both married. And her inspiration, he began to write again, his, her inspiration and their, because of the joy they had in their marriage. If you could bring up that next slide for me. You know this man. H.G. Wells, the time machine. You also know it was about the first men in the moon. And then uh, to, to spark everyone else's imagination is the war of the worlds. And this fueled people's minds and drove science fiction for years. Wartime methods are different. Uh, we have chariots and horses, swords, spears, battering rams, fire, stones, as opposed to today, gunpowder, high caliber shells, tanks, drones, battleships, F-16s, and neutron bombs. H.G. Wells uh, wrote, if we don't end war, war will end us. But in his outline of history, he also wrote this, I'm a historian, I'm not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is the most prominent figure of all time. You can't study history without realizing that. But in framing history and in the context of life and because of technology, not to mention cyber warfare today, spying, lying, cheating, stealing, and perverse imaginations that can be incubated by the internet. The time frames and events of when people grew up can cause peoples of the world to take notice and take the prophecies of the prophets relative to their country, their culture, their land, their events, the Caesars, the fall of the Roman Empire, the Dark Ages, World War I, World War II, the Holocaust, earthquakes, volcanoes, floods, tsunamis, lions, tigers, and bears. <laughs> and so we equate all of that with the last days to where when we get to locusts, they're helicopters, they're F-16s, they're drones because they're relative to our culture and to our technology. But you see, there's always been earthquakes and volcanoes uh, erupting. There's always been tsunamis and floods right? But Yeshua told us that it would increase in the last days. But how would you know? How, who here is over 100 years old? We only know one person, and that person moved to California, but uh, except for Bob Whitman's mother. Uh, but how would you know what happened two or 300 years ago if you lived during this period of time and said, these are the last days? Well, guess what? When Peter got up on Shavuot, he was talking about the last days. It's been the last days for the last 2,000 years. But it was spoken of by these prophets pointing to that day, and that's what the book of Joel, the prophecy of Joel does. The day of the Lord, okay, exclusively has to do with Israel. God's judgment on the nations, his plans and his eternal purpose without any of man's help. America might be prosperity conscious, 
The EU, uh, European Union might be more socialistic oriented uh, with some capitalism. Russia and China, of course, the same, but uh, can be godless due to communism, except for the 200 million in China that are underground believers. But their perspective of death has little or no dependence on the prophecies of the prophets and their pronouncement of the day of the Lord. So everybody's viewpoint about what's gonna happen in the last days, they might have a different viewpoint, could write all the books and movies that you want to about it, what you think it is, but it's, the word is what defines its own terms. That which has passed and has happened in Israel and other nations, and that which will still happen and hasn't been yet fulfilled is in this prophecy. And so the day of the Lord uh, you know, uses imagery of what in this prophecy of what it already or would occur in days that is a picture of what we need to expect and that which is to come. And so now there are reference points in the book of Joel. Are you with me so far? Did I lose you? You want to go back to War of the Worlds? There are reference points in the book of Joel that progressively takes you from his present day to the future in the day of the Lord. Are you ready? Joel chapter one, verse two, it's on your notes. Hear this. Joel comes out, he doesn't say, he, he doesn't have any great announcement. You know he's the son of Peth, Pethuel. You know he's Joel, doesn't tell you where he lives, doesn't tell you what rain it was. He just, he comes out and he says, listen old men and give ear. All you inhabitants of the land, hath something like this happened in your days? And even in the days of your fathers? Tell, it, tell your children of it and then let your children tell their children and then let their children another generation. In other words, what's happened here? And he's talking about his day. What's happened and what he saw? He says, have you ever seen anything like this? He says, well, you better remember it and you tell it to your children and their children and their children. So it could be passed on. This in itself is a Hebraic, Hebraism. It's a thought and it comes from the, the Torah. That's what this whole thing, what he's talking about here is what makes prophecy relevant. Moses set this precedent in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 5. Talking about the children of Israel, he's rehearsing this. He says, they have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because of their blemish. They're a perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus requite the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you and made you and established you? And then he says, remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, he will show you your elders and they will tell you. So this is something that Moses set in precedent. It's in the minds of every child that began to learn the Torah is that if you want to find out where you're going, you need to look back and see where you came from. And the fathers, the elders, they'll tell you, remember, and so the old men were taught by long experience that when something was unusual or it was not according to the course of nature to take particular notice. Okay, what does that mean? Well, if you have a, red, you have a sea that parts and you have close to three million people go through it and then it closes up and the Pharaoh and his army drown in a foot of water, it's more than a foot of water, that's something that's not true to the normal course of nature. Would you agree? Okay, so this is what jo Joel is saying, and he, he then talks about things to take notice of in this prophecy that are of note. What are they? Okay, and I'm going to skip through certain things and backtrack. Where's that clock? Yikes. In Joel chapter 1 verse 4, are you with me so far? Are you following me? There's one person at the camera there. Okay, it says what the, it talks about locusts, what the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. And then it talks about, in verse 10, talks about the corn, the, war, the oil, and the wine. In verse 10, the fields are laid waste, the ground mourns because the grain is destroyed, the wine fails, the oil languishes. Israel carries, uh, Israel is very dependent upon agriculture, and so there are many agricultural illustrations all through the Bible relative to the land because God's blessings are shown through agriculture in the land, how, God, how the people are dependent upon God to bring forth the fruit of the ground and the rain. So it's paramount to Israel. 
Uh, this word corn, you're going to see this as we go through this, the word dagon, because it also shows up as wheat and barley, but it also mentions wheat and barley in verse 11. Be confounded, O tillers of the soil. Well, vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. Then it talks about the priests. In verse 13, gird yourselves with sackcloth and lament, you priests, the Kohen. Well, you ministers, Sharath of the altar, come, lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God. Who did Jonah go to when he went to Nineveh? We just read this, it's in this book, right? He, the, the king put on sackcloth, remember? So Jonah talks about a king. Here he's talking about first with the priest. Then it talks about the daily sacrifices in verse, uh, the, the second part of verse 13. And, and in your English Bibles, or depending on what version you, you use, it says meat offering, but it's actually meal offering. Those of you that have gone through with, with Torah and the study of Leviticus, you know about uh, the offerings uh, and the sacrifices and what uh, a, a peace offering is, a meal offering, uh, and a minka, and that's what this is here. It says, uh, it says for the meal offering, which is a minka offering, and the drink offering, which is a libation offering, are withholden from the house of your God. So if you can bring up this uh, next slide for me here, what we're talking about in the book of Joel is what God does is he makes something happen that puts them in a situation where it's the inability for them to worship him. Because, well, let's look at it this way. It, we, you know, the churches meet all over the world uh, in this country, and, and we've probably made famous a, a, fa a, a, a famous way of worshiping with, uh, in fact, we were watching some one popular spiritual station uh, the other night, and uh, th this band was on. I'll tell you, I've seen some pretty wild rock and roll groups in my day, man, but this one, if this was a worship team, man, it must have been from... <laughs> But I mean, there are some wild ways that people worship today, and if that's how God worships, I'm a little worried how he wants worship. Okay, so America has invented that, right? With amplifiers and guitars and so on and so forth. Many of us that are baby boomers, we've been brought up on hymns, which still go through our minds, and you know, we've, we, you know, we, we've heard that on the CD before we started. Uh, but there's some wild forms of worship. You know, there's a TV program here in America uh, that was on not too long ago called Revolution. Any of you, have you ever, need, have you seen that program? Yikes. <laughs> what it's about was um, somebody shut the power off. They had the ability to shut the power off over the whole world. So they, could, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't ride ca cars, planes, all of that. And so therefore they couldn't listen to music either. I mean, there were still musical instruments left, but after a period of time, nobody knew how it sounded anymore. This culture that we have in America, we talk about worship is so dependent upon the type of music that was generated in the 20th century. You believe that? Of course, it goes back much further than that with choirs and so on and so forth. I'm not condemning it, but I'm saying what music has evolved to today uh, sometimes there can be a clear distinction as to, uh, is this a rock con I mean, one time, well, I don't, well <laughs> is this a rock concert or is this a, are we worshiping God here? Do you need music to worship God? Uh, what do you need to do to get in the presence of God? Each one of you have to ask yourself that question. And quite frankly, the mode of worship with Israel, how they worshiped God was through the offerings, Right? When they came to the temple and they brought their offerings, that's how, what does Corbin mean? It means to draw near. It was done by way of the offerings. The minka offering was one that involved grain and involved oil. There was wine that was involved with, uh, with these offerings as well. It was their ability to come near to God. And so this is what we see here, if you bring that PowerPoint back up for me, uh, of the people bringing their offerings to draw near to God and the priests who were involved with that, the wave offerings, the priests who participated all together. It was fellowship together and with God. That was, that was, how they, that was their form of worship. That was the form of worship. That's God says, draw near to me. 
And specifically, this minka offering, which it talks about in Joel, and a libation offering. It's talking about the corn or the grain, the oil, and the wine. In fact, those of you that may have read Edersheim's uh, book on the temple and the tabernacle or the temple and talks about the libation ceremony that takes place on the seventh day or Shemini Atzeret, the, the last day of the feast. And Pastor Mark's taught on it many, many times and they do the water and the wine, the libation ceremony there in the temple. They said it's the most joyous time. If you have not seen a libation ceremony, now none of us have and we may not ever see that, but in the temple at the time that it, that it happened, it was, it was the most joyous event that there could be. Okay, so you see how I framed this here for you. This, the offerings disappearing. How did they disappear? Well, in Haggai chapter one, verse 11, the Lord says, I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains. And he mentions the corn the oil, and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground brings forth. Well, what about wheat and barley? If you take away the wheat and barley, what feasts of the Lord are you affecting? You're affecting Shavuot with the, because of the wheat harvest and then the barley harvest during the days of the counting of the Omer. That's a big problem because all the men were required to come up to the feasts. And so here, this, this happens. What happens? The result in Joel 116, is not food cut off from your eyes? Hey, how did this, can you imagine waking up? How did this happen? We're going to see that. In verse 18, how do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. What happens when you have the flocks of sheep who can't eat and they go desolate? What happens? Well, now you don't have any burnt offerings or, or trespass offerings or sin offerings because... The cattle are dying off, okay? Who's in charge of all this? Okay, so there was a ceasing, you know, and this was devastating. To, where is this happening? Which is important, where is this happening? In Israel. It's happening in Israel. In the frame of the day of the Lord. This was devastating to Israel who embraced the presence of God in worship through these offerings, the, the, the drawing near. Uh, look at verse 16 again. Is not the food cut off from our eyes? Yea, what? Joy and gladness from the house of our God. See, there was joy that was involved in those offerings and that worship of God and coming to the temple. Well, look at this. Hey, in Psalm 104, 14, talking about the Lord, thou dost, dost cause the grass to grow for the cattle, Plants for man to cultivate. Do we have that squared away? Okay. You can build any greenhouse you want. Who causes the grass to grow and plants to cultivate and so on? Okay. It's the Lord. That he might bring forth food from the earth. And then what does it say in verse 15? Again, look at this. Wine to what? Gladden the heart of man. Oil to make his face shine. And bread to what? Strengthen man's heart. Now look at those words, folks. What does that mean? What does oil represent? Oil that makes a man's face shine. What other is that than the anointing? What does bread represent? The word, the word of life. The bread of life. And that strengthens our hearts. What does wine represent? Well, it's a number of things, but communion with God, fellowship with him. Due to the close relationship uh, uh, to the ongoing life of the community in association with uh, grain, the oil, and the wine. It's also representative. The wine is representative of covenant blessings that God promised to Israel for, because of their obedience and which he could with, withhold for disobedience. Finally, wine represents joy, celebration, festivity, uh, expressing the abundant blessings of God. And we see this in certain feasts that it was commanded to drink wine. Okay, so it was part of the act, it was part of it, it doesn't mean you get drunk, but it was part of the festivities. Many of you do that on Friday night on Sh Ever Have Shabbat, right? Drink, some, drink wine or grape juice or whatever, that's what it really was. It's all in the context of worship. So God had to get their attention, and so how did he do this? 
And in what context is this? Well, look at verse 5 of Joel. And I told you I was going to backtrack. Alas for the day. What's the context? For the day of the Lord is near. And as destruction from the Almighty it comes. What's significant about, because it, now it goes through this here, if you can bring up that next slide for me, and talking about the oil and the grain and the wine. This is in Leviticus 2.1, when anyone offers a grain offering, which is the minka offering to the Lord, it shall be a fine flour, which is the grain, pour oil on it, frankincense, bring it to Aaron's sons, and then they put it and they burn it for a memorial on the altar, and there's certain of these offerings that uh, it actually says on here, the rest of the grain offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. So the priest partook of this, of these offerings, and it was all part of that fellowship and worship. Now, when it starts to talk about the locusts here, how many of you have been in a locust storm? I haven't. I've just seen pictures of it. But when the locusts come, this is what, what it looks like, a dark cloud. Uh, these guys are uh, not necessarily nice guys. Uh, I wouldn't want to wake up with that on my chest. They actually have the appearance of having some choppers right here. They got great dentists. But when they start gnawing away on something, they can really gnaw away. Well, look how what happens here to bring about the absence of the corn, the oil, and the wine. Okay, this is the context that we're talking about in the day of the Lord. God withdraws the ability to draw near to him. How does he do it? And this, and so many people in their imaginations, they start off this way. I'm not saying it couldn't be, well, these locusts are, uh, they're this, and it really looks like a helicopter because of the blades. And ooh. This first one that it talks about, uh, it says, what the cutting locust left is the word gazam. It means the palmer worm in some of your versions. It means to shear. It visits in the autumn. doesn't mean all four of these came all at once, okay? The gazam came, and it, and it came in the autumn, and it just sheared things. And then came the swarming locust. So what the cutting locust left, the swarming locust came in, and that ate. It's a younger brood. It's a swarm that shed its skin uh, and so it, it ate what was left there. And then the hopping locust, what the swarming locust left, the, har, the, the hopping locust has eaten. That's the word, yekek. it's a caterpillar. It laps up everything else that's overlooked. And then there's what's called the kasil, which is the destroying locust. So what the hopping locust didn't eat, these were all locusts, the kasil means the finisher. It got everything. It got it so much, and I don't think I... I put this verse on there, but it gets it, got it right down to the bone where it was white. The, the, the stem was white, there was nothing left, and it went into the soil, and you see that here. And this shows that in the last days, the significance is, is that when destruction comes, it could come in stages, just like these locusts, and wear people down to where their faith is worn down, and Yeshua reflects this, and he says about, talks about it in Luke chapter 18, verse 8. He says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Years ago, when we were new believers, we'd read these verses and think, oh, I, got, but I have such great faith. You know, I, I'm, that's, how could that be? Jesus is coming back and finding, how, what does it mean he's not going to find faith on the earth? I'm going to be firm to the end. Well, he's, he's going to come and he's going to say, is he going to find faith on the earth? How does that happen? In successive stages, wearing people down. When worship is compromised, which Israel was all about, the tabernacle and the temple, men begin to go through the motions, even though it looks like worship, but there's no oil. The anointing's not there. There's no joy in it. The wine is, the fresh wine's not there. There's no word, there's no bread, there's no grain in the worship. There's no desire for worship then, and the actions of men are in the flesh, and they're not according to the word, and it's not in the spirit. And Yeshua said in John 4, 23, the hour comes, and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father with a rock group. No. <laughs> worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father, what? Seeks such to worship him. 
So how does God begin to deal with this? Okay, and I'm backtracking again. Okay, so set the stage with the wearing down, the different points uh, that are reference points in this book. And so where does he start? He starts with the, the wine, and he says in verse five, he says, wake up, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, the new wine, for it's cut off from your mouth. How did the wine get cut off? Well, if the vines are ravaged by the, the, the locust, then there's no wine. Uh, you can't get the grapes, so there's nothing to press. And if you go over all, you go, those of you that have been to Israel, almost any of the ruins in the city that you go to, you can see the presses that are inside of the city, that they either press the olives or they press the grapes. This word awake means shaking somebody like they're, you know, shaking them out of sleep. Those that are fond of wine will be the first to suffer. Why? Uh, the excesses of the flesh, perhaps, uh, they receive their joy in fleshly things. They need to hear some new thing. Uh, and then when they don't hear some new thing, the joy leaks out. In verse 8 of Joel, it says, lament. The next thing is to lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. Uh, and that means to be well. You know, in, in a wife, a, a new, a betrothed wife or a new wife, a bride, uh, that first year, they, they take that year completely off, uh, just the husband and the wife. And this is a situation where the, the, the husband and the wife were separated because of some reason. And the, and the virgin or the wife just be well. She's separated. And this is showing us like Israel being separated from God, what they're so used to. This is, they believe this is how we get close to God, these, these offerings, this worship. And they're just cut off like a husband and a wife separated. And then he says in verse 11, he says, Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen. Howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley. Why the wheat and the barley? Because those are specific to what? To the feast, Shavuot, Sukkot. The, day, the counting of the Omer. And that word ashamed is really interesting because it means to turn pale. So the husbandmen, the reason the husbandmen are freaking out and why they're pale is because they're looking at the crop, everything that was just destroyed, but that's not so bad in the fact that no, they did, the locusts got everything. That means that nothing next year is going to come up either. So they turn pale because of discouragement from the destruction, their future crop is destroyed. In, in verse 12, it says, the vine is dried up, the fig tree languishes, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, the apple tree, all the trees of the field are withered. This word dried up or withered, um, it's a, the same Hebrew word for ashamed as it is for withered, it's yabesh. Uh, and, and the way it reads in the verse, it, it hammers it to like, you know, the, the, the shame of it, the discouragement of it, it's withered away, it's done. Well, so what's the outcome? Joy is withered away from the sons of men. And so this is where God now begins to work. Did he get their attention? I hope so. Did you somebody say, I hope so? I hope so. And so in verse 13, it says, gird yourself. Who does he start? Who would you think he'd start with first? Hmm? That's right. Well, it says it right there, so. You got a cheat sheet. Gird yourselves and lament, you priests. Howl, you ministers of the altar. Well, there was nothing left to do now. There was no sacrifices, so the only thing that they had left to do was to pray. Okay, if you're a believer and your Bible disappears, there's no church to go to, your CDs don't work, your iPod doesn't work, so you can't play worship music anymore. You can't go to the worship service at the church because everything is shut down. What are you going to start doing? Praying. Oh, God, it's a great way that he gets our attention. Can I get your attention now? Did I have to take everything away to do it? He says, come, lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God, for the meat offering, the meal offering, and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. See, the priests required sacrifices to approach God. In fact, look at this here in this verse. By the way, it gets better. I finish on a happy note, so don't feel so bad yet. <laughs> it says, come lie all night in sackcloth. Look what he says. You ministers of who? My God. He's telling 
them, you know, my God's requiring you to repent. The, meat offer, the meal offering and the drink offering is withholding from the house of what? Your God. You needed that to get close to God. And so now he's saying repent. So what's the action? In verse 14, he says, sanctify ye a fast. Why do you have a fast? Why does anybody fast? Because you want to lose weight? Not necessarily. The reason biblically why you do a fast is to put the flesh into subjection so you can get your head quiet and your stomach quiet for a short period of time. And that's what he says. Sanctify, set aside a fast, call a solemn assembly. And then he names, he says, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Okay, no, let's, okay let's do this. Get the, let's see. Let's call up that guy that's got the amplifier and uh, he's got a great worship team at this church and he said, repent, be fast, wail, cry out to God. And then again in ver chapter two, verse one, blow ye the shofar in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, why? Because the day of the Lord comes, for it is near at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong that hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. This is really interesting because here's the shift in chapter 2, verse 1. We talk about actual physical destruction that happens with the locust, wearing down the land, taking away their ability to worship and get close to God, telling them to get their hearts right and focus towards God. And it, and it talks about the physical locusts. Now, in the, it, looking towards the future, it talks about a people. It talks about, it's alluding to an, to an army. Uh, and it talks about it as a day of darkness, gloominess, clouds. Uh, look at Jeremiah 4, verse 5. Declare ye where? In Judah. And publish where? In Jerusalem. And say, blow the trumpet or sound the shofar in the land. Cry, gather together, assemble yourselves. And look at it in, in uh, Matthew 24, 21, when Yeshua was talking to his disciples. For then shall there be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor shall ever be. He's really putting the severity of that time. He's saying, look, never has it been, except those days should be shortened, no flesh will be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And in Zephaniah, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly even the voice of the day of the Lord. In verse 15, of Zephaniah 1. That day is a day of wrath, a, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, darkness, gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet, the shofar, an alarm against the fe fenced cities and against the high towers. So now it's talking physically and about an assault actually on Judah and Jerusalem in Israel. And this was the, the same terminology that Zephaniah used Joel used. Who used it first? We don't know. But this reference switches now to an approaching army. They move in their place. The verses, I'm not going to read them. You can read them uh, in chapter 2. But when this army comes in, they move in place together. They're not haphazard. And the night is blackest before the dawn. Uh, and as, you know, uh, that's what they say, and of course you can see that as well if you stay up for the sunrise, it's always darkest before the dawn. But they say that to, as a picture, as the imagery of these locusts, as they're coming in, and locusts come in from the southeast, and that's important to know, they don't come in from the north. Later references made here that uh, the Lord does away with those that came from the north uh, in, in allusion to an army. But whatever was going to come over those mountains, the picture of it is these locusts. Bring up that slide for me, that PowerPoint. And when these locusts would come over the mountain, just before, as the sunrise is coming up, the, the sunlight would, would reflect off of their bottom, the bottom of their wings, and it would be an absolutely terrifying sight because instead of it getting lighter, it got blacker from the locusts, and the underside of their wings reflected the sunlight. It was terrifying. And that's what the Lord is saying. It's going to be terrifying. A day of darkness and gloominess. 
But the sounding of the shofar, blow the shofar, is always for provision, uh, always for, for calling upon God to come and to bring help. Uh, they needed to return to God in their hearts with worship. Look at verse 10 of chapter 2. The earth will quake before them, the heavens will tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Uh, now you know that, of course, here it doesn't say blood moon, here it refers that the sun and the moon will be dark. And the stars will withdraw their shining. So those that look to the stars for their direction, they would lose it because the, the, the light would fade. The Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. He is strong that executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide in it? Therefore also now says the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart. There's the solution. Look, guys, turn to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart, not your garments, rend your heart. And not your garments, turn to the Lord your God, for he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and it repents him of the evil. What do you know about that last phrase? Who can tell me what's significant about that last phrase? There's four of the 13 attributes of God in that last part of that verse. Okay? Uh, he's gracious, he's merciful, he's slow to anger, he's long-suffering, and he's of great kindness, which is chesed, okay? And so we see, as I've shared actually over the past month and a half from the Torah portions, that Jer both Jeremiah uh, and the different prophets, when they're crying out to God, including Moses, they come up with some part of those 13 attributes of God's character and pleading to him. And that's what happens here. God points to what that is. He says in verse 18, then will the Lord, when that happens, when you cry to me, when you rend your heart, the Lord will be jealous for his land and pity his people. We're starting to turn the corner. We're making progress. We got, I think I got their attention. He's jealous for his land. He pities his people. Yeah, the Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, what's the first thing he's going to do? He's going to begin to restore the worship the ability to bring Corbin, to draw near to him. That's what he wants. How does he do that? Is anybody with me here? He says, behold, I send the what? The corn, the wine, and the oil. And you shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. So he gets into... Hear the prayer of the priests, the prayer of the people. In verse 16, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. He goes everywhere from the infants all the way up to the old men. All of them, he says everybody. The people, the congregation, the infants, bring everybody, gather them all together. And then it says, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet, which means even that thing which is deemed uh, so tenderly, that, that marital relationship, they come back together after a long separation. That's the imagery that God gives. This separation, that this bringing back together is evident in the relationship that this, this drought, this destruction would come to an end. In verse 17, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people. Who goes to intercede for the people? The priests. And it says it's between the porch and the altar. You know why they were told to weep between the porch and the altar? The porch was known as the ulam. It's the vestibule where the priest would receive the sacrifice. Here the... Uh, God is telling them to weep between the porch and the altar uh, because they were acknowledging that there was distance between them and God. God is the one here who would do the repositioning. Now, it's, if you weren't paying attention before, you want to pay attention now. God is the one doing the repositioning. God turns when he begins to see his people repent. And so God's mercy turns the corner. We begin to see God's mercy poured out. We see, as we started off with Joel, that there's destruction because of these locusts and wears down the corn, the oil, and the wine, but now we're turning the corner. 
And in verse 19, it says, Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I send you corn, wine, and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no longer make you an approach, reproach among the heathen. Fear not, O, o, o land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Remember Revelation chapter 6, verse 6. I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts, a measure of wheat for a penny. Three measures of barley for a penny, and see that thou hurt not what? The oil and the wine. Jeremiah 31, 12. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord for wheat. This word wheat again is this word uh, dagon. It's the same as the, it's also used for corn or grain. And for the wine and for the oil and for the young of the flock and of the herd and their soul shall be as a watered garden and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Why? Because worship is now being the ability to, to bring Corbin, to bring the offerings, to worship God, to fellowship with him is being restored. Is that where we want to be? Is that what will get us through what's coming? Is our closeness to God? Well, look at this. God sets it up even more. This is incredible. I borrowed that from Pastor Mark. Look at this. Joel 2.23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you what? The former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And it says, and the floors, which are, that's the word, means talking about the threshing floors, shall be full of wheat, and vats shall overflow with wine and oil. Now, I want you to look at this here. This is what's really cool. Because God says he's going to send the former and the latter rain, which is for the spring and for the, uh, the fall harvest, the rain that will, will feed the, next, uh, the, the, the fallow ground so that the next crop can come. He says he's going to send the former and latter rain, but look, it says he hath given you the former rain moderately. And scholars, many, many scholars and rabbis agree uh, because of the Hebrew word that's here, th these words that are here, and if you can bring up that next that PowerPoint for me, uh, it's these words, ha more um, sedaka, uh, and it's actually what it's talking about, and what they almost all agree that this actually refers to, because it already talks about in the latter part of the verse, the former and the latter rain, but then it says the, before that it says, bring you the former rain moderately, but it's the words Hamare Sadaka, which actually means the righteous teacher. He'll bring the righteous teacher. Why? Because it's the Mashiach, the Messiah, who will cause the change to happen through his teaching. Is that amazing? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> All right. But back up for a second here, because it says the floors, the threshing floors shall be full of wheat. And this is the word bar for barin for uh, wheat. It can mean grain of any kind that's standing in the field like corn or, or wheat. But where is the threshing floor in Israel? Where is it? Where is the threshing floor that David purchased? It's on Mount Moriah. He went specifically to purchase it. It's where, it's where the temple mount is. The king is the one that will do the threshing. He separates what? The wheat from the what? The chaff. Who does that? The righteous teacher, the king, on the threshing floor. Look in verse 25. He says, I'll restore to you the years which a swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. Verse 26, it says, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I'm in the midst of Israel. And that I, the Lord, am your God and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Why is that important to us? Number one, we don't live in the, in the land. And number two, we're grafted into those covenant promises with Israel. So when our buddies are doing good, what does that mean? That means we're doing good. Hey, I want to tap into that juice. Shoot me some more. Okay? That's what that means to us. But God doesn't end it there, okay? Because now that he's got that part of it squared away, 
and whatever could take place here, and I didn't go into a lot of detail on this, all of you last days and end times people that would love to hear about armies and helicopters, F-16s, neutron bombs, earthquakes, volcanoes, lions, tigers, and bears, okay? God does, he goes much better than that. He's turned the corner with his who? His people. He wants his people to, to come to him. And then we get to Joel chapter three, verse one. Okay, and it's only five verses long, which in your King James or any other version, it's all lumped into three chapters, but it uses these five verses. What are these verses? They're the ones that in Acts chapter two, verse 14, that Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost. It'll come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, young men will see visions, and also upon the servants, the handmaids, everybody in those days, I'm gonna pour out my spirit. I'll show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon into what? Blood, blood moons. Remember before when we read in the verses in Joel, the sun and the moon are what? darkened. The stars lose their light. Here it's talking about the blood moon before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And it's quoted in Joel chapter 2 and in verse 5, the first part of verse 5, it'll come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Okay, it's a promise of God. Not all of this verse has come to pass because we haven't seen the blood, the pillar, uh, uh, the pillars of smoke, the fire. We haven't yet seen the blood moons to fall on the feasts, which are coming up next year. What is not quoted? You remember Yeshua went into the temple when he began his ministry in Luke chapter 4? And remember, he, this is the day, the acceptable day of the Lord. He says to preach the gospel to the poor. Remember that? You know what I'm talking about? Help me and say, yes, I'm listening to you, Pastor Art. Very first part. And then he stops and he closes the scroll. And he says, this day is fulfilled in your ears. But he didn't quote the rest of it, which was what? The day of the vengeance of our Lord, right? Peter gets up and quotes this from Joel, but he doesn't finish the last part of this prophecy, which the Jews, when they put it into chapters, they made this prophecy in five verses in one chapter. What's the second part of that verse? For in where? Mount Zion and in where? Jerusalem shall be deliverance. As the Lord hath said, and, the, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Okay, in, in, in chapter 4, verse 1, For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Who was Peter talking to on the day of Pentecost? Judah and Jerusalem. There's still a future deliverance from captivity for Judah and Jerusalem. Look at verse 2. I will gather all the nations. This is God said, this is it. This is it. I'm going to gather all the nations and I'll bring them uh, down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, uh, whom they have, sh look at this, scattered among the nations. Hang on here. Uh, scattered among the nations and what? Parted my land. Okay. Parted my land. Now, those of you that are English majors, okay, what does that mean, parted, E-D? It means, it's a, it means it happened, right? And we got these guys, if you bring up that slide for me, that say things like, we'll only negotiate on 1967 lines. What does that mean? That means we're going to take Israel's land from them. But it says here, they parted my land. And so now he says, I'm going to gather these into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, of course, was the king of Judah. It's not referring to him, but Jehoshaphat means Yehovah judges. He's talking about a future day. And in verse 11, he says, Assemble yourselves, come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Okay, leave that slide up for me because there are some uh, discrepancies on what they believe is the valley of Jehoshaphat. Um, uh, this is a, a very a broad horizontal view. Uh, here's the Mount of Olives over here is the Temple Mount. So the Valley of Jehoshaphat uh, is, is a little bit in the distance. This is actually the Kidron Valley here, which I'm going to mention in just a minute. It's near the Temple Mount. Here's the Mount of Olives. 
Uh, and then during the time of David, uh, uh, you can see the Tyropian Valley and the Kidron Valley that comes up here. But just going back to this here, you can see this horizontal view uh, because there's another valley that's north of here that the Lord is talking about. Uh, that is the Kidron Valley. Verse 12, let the heathen be wakened. Come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will judge all of the heathen round about. Jehoshaphat means Jehovah judges. He says, put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down, for the press is full, okay? Get the picture here. The press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. The, va the vats are overflowing with wickedness. And God said, that's it for the nations that came against the land. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. This word decision is the word karutz. Uh, it means actually a, a threshing, like a sledge having s sharp teeth. Uh, and this term is used in Hosea. Look at Hosea 2.21. It'll come to pass in that day, I will hear, says the Lord, I will hear the heavens and they shall hear the earth, and the earth shall hear the what? The corn, the wine, and the oil. And they shall hear what? Jezreel. That word here is actually the word ana. It means to pay attention. They'll respond. The earth will actually respond. The phrase Valley of Jezreel is sometimes used to refer to the central part of the valley around the city of Jezreel, while the southwestern portion, let me show you this, if you bring that back up for me. This is the Kidron Valley near Jerusalem. Uh, this is actually looking from Mount Carmel, and this is actually looking from Jezreel uh, towards the valley of uh, Megiddo. You can see it better here is the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Mount Carmel is over uh, here, Tabor is over here, uh, and then this is what's known as the Jezreel Valley. Uh, you can see Megiddo, you know this valley is also known as, the, as Ar what would be known as Armageddon, the Valley of Armageddon, which... Um, there, there's a little bit of discrepancy, not discrepancy, the rabbis talk about where is all of this going to happen because he says he's going to judge these nations. He's going to sit them down and he's going to go through a judgment. Jezreel means whom God sows. Look in verse 15 of Joel 4. The sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. Where is God gonna speak from in those days? From Jerusalem. Oh, God, I thought it was Moscow. Oh, I thought it was The Hague in the Netherlands. Oh, I thought it was Rome. No, it says Jerusalem. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So what's God's eternal purpose in verse 16? The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. Why, why will the Lord roar? Because he's the lion of Judah. The heavens and the earth will quake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall you know that I'm the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, and then shall Jerusalem be holy, and no strangers will pass through her anymore. It will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, hills shall flow with milk, rivers of Judah shall flow waters, and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Shedem. This word Shedem actually refers to acacia, means acacia. Uh, what was made out of acacia wood? The Ark of the Covenant. This is also associated it grows in the, it, or it grew in the valley of, of the Kidron Valley, uh, where the soil was arid enough for acacia to grow. And it says this water will flow out from the house of the Lord. Where have we seen that before, which Pastor Mark is going to cover here in the, the future, is in Ezekiel. Afterwards, he brought me into the door of the house. And behold, waters issued from under the threshold of the house eastward, talking about Inside the temple, the waters issued out from the side and began to flow, for the forefront of the house stood towards the east. The waters came down from under the right side of the house, talking about the temple at the south side of the altar. 
And it further talks about in Revelation 22, verse 1, he showed me a river, pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, bore 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. See, I told you it'd be a happy ending. See, no matter what damage that the locusts have done, God restores fellowship with his people, and from his temple flows forth living water that brings forth fruit of trees that brings healing to the nations. Is that what you want? Amen. So, is, so do we need to be afraid of the day of the Lord, except that we need to keep our hearts towards God and stay in worship with him? Amen. Did you learn anything tonight? Okay, let's stand. Father, thank you. Um, Father, thank you that, Father, you give us signposts and signals uh, from your Torah, from your word, from uh, the heavens um, on where you're going. Father, you, for what we can handle, you reveal your plans and your purposes uh, so that we can at least get a, get a view, Father, even if it's a distant view of that which is to come. But through the words of, of Yeshua, you said that unless he left, unless he, he left, he, he wouldn't be able, to, the comforter wouldn't come, and so the comforter has come, and that it, the promise was that it would show us things to come. Thank you, Father, for the signals and the warnings, that, Father, that together collectively as we're unified in heart towards you and worship, walking in your Torah, in your word, in spirit and in truth, we will enjoy the life that you have set before us in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thanks. God bless. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom.